Father, we thank you for your loving kindness that mercy triumphs over justice, that your desire is to save, that you have made a way, Lord, where by ourselves there would be no way, and that you've paid the bride price that no one else could pay in order, Lord, that we might have a hope, a certain hope for the future. We thank you that those who stand in the covenant, albeit we are yet to be perfected, can already say, Lord, that so long as we don't turn back, that you who've begun this good thing in us will, is faithful to finish it. That you, Lord, will do the things that we cannot and that you'll be able to present us perfect, without blemish, without spot, a radiant bride before your Father, able to stand and live in the presence of God face to face. With all this in mind, Lord, we, we pray and ask, Lord, that you remember those, Lord, who are not here tonight. Some are ill. It's that time of year again, Lord, for colds and flus. And Lord, we pray that you'd really draw near to them, and touch them and comfort them. I'm really conscious, Lord, of a couple of people that are really, really lonely and isolated, Lord, and it's very difficult in any practical way to do enough about that to make a difference. But I pray, Lord, because you are God who puts the lonely in families. So, Lord, I really pray for those you know who I mean, Lord. And for all, even those who I don't know and other people know like that, Lord, put the lonely in families according to your word, since that is who you are. We thank you, Lord, for Chris and Corey and uh, even Rima, Lord, going back to the Philippines. We're, we're already there. We pray, Lord, that you really shield them, guard them, go before them, and not just keep them safe and bless them, Lord, but anoint them to be a blessing, to share something, to have some fruit to show for their time. And Lord, we just ask that you would instruct us, write your law in our hearts and our minds. Help us, Lord, part the veil for us to see, take the scales from our eyes. Lord, just as Mel prayed before, really help us, Lord, to be fruitful branches. Give us what we lack. Help us, Lord, to be your disciples, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so tonight... I know it's a long time ago, but remember we started on Peter? I think we did that at Bobby's house, didn't we? Yeah. So, uh, so tonight we're going to move on, and you will have completely forgotten what part one was about. I know I did, I had to read it again. But in essence, Peter's first epistle, the bit we did last time, the introduction was really Peter reminding his readers that we have a real hope. What would a false hope look like? Lots of people in the world have unreal hopes. Can you think of any that people cling to, cling to, but actually they're a bit silly? What about the classic Kiwi one? The lotto. You know? Well, that's really their only plan. Their only plan is to win the lotto. <laughs> I mean, they might. It's only, I think it's only one in a hundred million chance or something. But, you know, whatever it is, you know, they might. But there's a lot of people that cling to things that actually cannot save them. So last time we listened to Peter reminding his readers that we're not like that. We have been called to have a hope in something real that can and will save us. Does anyone want to volunteer an idea? It's more than one right answer to this, but what would make having hope in the gospel, what makes that real and reliable in contrast to like saying the possibility of winning the lotto or something? What makes it different to anything else you might cling to. I said something deliberately wrong there. That's a clue. I said what's something else you might cling to. What's different with us? We don't cling to a something. 
we cling to a someone. The thing that makes our hope different is our hope is a living being who is supremely powerful. You know, so your lotto ticket is just inert, isn't it? Your lotto ticket can't help you win the lotto. It's just a piece of paper. You know, or your lucky, your lucky ticket or whatever else you might have, you know. All these things are unable to actually offer any assistance in your rescue because they are not God. The difference with our hope is we have hope in a person. And if anyone's ever asking you, how does Jesus save? You know, people say things, oh, well, he died on the cross for you. What does that mean to an unbeliever? Has anyone actually had someone you know, like a street evangelist come, tell you that, do you know, Jesus died on the cross for you? Has anyone you ever been on the receiving end of that? Do you remember how dumb it sounded when you're on the receiving end? And you're like, it's really tempting to say, and? But we forget. If you just say something like that, people go, what's it mean? So if anyone ever asks you, this is slightly off topic, but it's worth knowing, what's the, what is the most basic reason that Jesus is able to save you? And it's, this part is to do with our topic. So if we talk about to save, what was the first question that would come to mind? If I said, Faith, you need saving, what's the first thing that pops in your head? From wild lions? From storms? Earthquakes? Isn't the very first question? From what? Because people, Christians, leap leap to you need your sins forgiven and everything right but for an, for someone who doesn't know the gospel they're still confused why do i need what what are my sins and what why do they need to be forgiven and saved from what so what's the from what say from this is this is a trick one say from sin actually the answer is no it's not say from sin what is sin? Sin is the problem that causes something that you need saving from. Yeah. Sin itself, death was kind of yeah, like that, yeah. but nothing actually dies. All souls are eternal. Hell, Hell yeah. Desire. You're getting closely. You're getting closely? Ah, uh, yeah, let, we can put that in there. So so we put this as like wrong desires. Okay, so what if I do the same thing as I did before because I am being naughty? What if I change that to who? Who do we need saving from? Now, Hollywood will say the devil. You need Jesus to rescue you from the devil. Is that true? Who does the devil work for? He works for God. He doesn't really comprehend it, but ultimately everything Satan does is part of God's design, right? Satan can only do what God permits him or empowers him to do, apart from God giving him the authority to do it. Remember when he wants to test Job? Why doesn't he just test Job? Because he can't. He has to ask God's permission. You know, so you're not saved. So the first one is it's not to be saved from Satan. No. Saving from? Yeah, so who are we being saved from? God. Your salvation is to save you from God, which might sound crazy, except Mary Lee already hit the nail on the head. What aspect of God do you need saving from? Isn't salvation to be with God? Yeah, you know, to be reconciled to God. But, but to be reconciled, these other things that we wrote create a problem, don't they? These things are going to result in 
judgment. And not any old judgment, his judgment. The reason Jesus can save you is because he's the judge. He's the only one that convince the judge to let you off. Why can he convince the judge? Because he is the judge. You've sinned, but against who? Him. All your sin is ultimately against Jesus. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they are echad, remember? And the Father has been pleased to put all power, authority and might in the hands of his Son to bring about the fulfilment of everything that is written. That's scripture, okay? It really pays to understand this, that what Jesus is doing on the cross is making a way so that the law can be satisfied, so that he can, as the judge, relieve himself of the necessity of sending you to hell. Because as judge, he doesn't have any option. He, his own nature cannot permit him to let you into heaven if you are an unredeemed sinner. So God, and if you like, is satisfying his own love by making a way for himself to forgive people. Because once the judgment day arrives, if they've rejected that, he just can't do anything. His own nature won't permit him to do anything except throw that person into hell which he doesn't really want to do. Remember it's written, God takes no delight in the destruction of sinners. So this might explain for you why it says in the scripture, whoever the Son has set free is what? It's free indeed. Why are they free indeed? Because the one to, who, were, you know, who is going to judge you, if the one who is going to ultimately judge you says, go free, who then can override that? You understand? So the cross and everything else is God making a way for himself to be able to save you from his own judgment without breaking his law. Remember, because he's righteous and holy. So he can't cancel his law. He had to do something that satisfied the law so that he could give can anyone think of another scripture about Jesus that tells you that ultimately all this is about him being able to having satisfied the law's requirements he can save anybody that does what he asks and it's this he gives life to whomever he is pleased to give it salvation is 100% his decision. But who is he pleased to give it to? He makes that plain in what else he says. He's pleased to give it to his disciples. All the promises in the gospel, look at who they are to. You won't find any promises of the, you know, the, the good sort in the gospel that aren't spoken to his disciples. He's pleased to give all these things, including life, life eternal to his disciples. So everything we're learning really, if you like, is how to make more certain that we are the people he wants to give that life to. Does that make sense? And please try and avoid corny one-liners like Jesus died for you, because having been on the receiving end of stuff like that, people have no idea especially in the church, try it sometime if you're visiting a church. Just pretend you don't know and say to someone, why did Jesus have to die? How does the, how does the cross work? Watch them look at you blankly. Most people don't have the, any idea. Anyway, so having introduced the fact that we have a, a real and certain hope because our hope is in a, a living all-powerful person who can actually act on our behalf, not just some inert bit of paper like a auto ticket. Peter moves on to some specifics, which is where we go tonight. 
starting in verse 13. And it all hovers around this word, holiness. In Hebrew, Kodesh. And who can tell me what it means in the simplest English translation would be? To be what? To be set apart, that's right. To be set apart. So that's basically what this Hebrew word means. And if you think about the temple, which is the most holy place? You know, so in Hebrew it's the Kodesh, Kodeshim. The most holy of the holy places. Because all the places in the temple were holy. But this is the holy of the holy places, meaning the most set apart of all the set apart places. And remember we talked, I think last week maybe, about you know the architecture of the temple. What's on the very edge? It's the court of the Gentiles. Who can go there? Anyone. So it's not very set apart, is it? But to go into the next layer, you have to be Jewish. So it's set apart to Jews. Then the next one is only for the Levites, the priests. So even, uh, even other Jews can't go there. It's set apart. It's more set apart. And then right in the very center is where the Ark of the Covenant was. It's the most set apart of all the set apart places because only the high priest could go there and then only once a year, the Holy of Holies. So Peter wants to talk to us about this idea here and how it affects your salvation. So we're going to look at 1 Peter 1, 13 until 24. So uh, Davina, do you want to do like just till we get tired and then just go around till we get do a bit, a bit? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13? Yep. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil <coughs> desires you had when you live in ignorance. But just as, the, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Verse 17, since you call on a father who judges, each person's works impartially, live out your time as foreigners here is revered, in revered fear. Reverend. In reverent fear. Verse 18, <laughs> <laughs> For you know that it was done with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world that was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living, enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word that was preached to you. That very last one from Isaiah 40. Can anyone, test your memory, can anyone tell me where in the calendar of feasts that scripture is really the key? The one that's read, it's read by fathers to their sons at the end of the week. Can you remember? I'll give you a clue. It's to do with the grass withering. Booth. Yeah. So remember at the... So you got the spring holy days and then your autumn holy days, the spring holy days talk all point to what Jesus does at the first coming. 
the autumn holy days at the other end of the cycle point to what Jesus will do at the second coming. And the last of them is Sukkot, the Feast of Booths. Okay, So you live in a booth for a week and you take all your meals with your family and everything. And on the first day, because you build it with your sons, there's certain branches and types of, there's four kinds of plants you're allowed to use to build this thing. And a, and a sukkah, that's where you get the word sukkot from, booths. It's just a temporary dwelling. So if you like, uh, a way more temporary version of a nipa hut. You know, so a nipa hut's meant to last some months or years, isn't it? But like a sukkah should just last, you know, a, a week. Because you're nomadic through the desert, you know. And during that time, they will recount the story about how God brought them through the wilderness into the promised land and at the end of the week the father will bring his sons out and having taught them all this because remember it's all about teaching the kids and he'll put his hand on the booth of the sukkah and you know it's israel so what's the temperature probably during the day close to 50 you know and so if you are a green leaf on monday what are you on sunday yeah, <laughs> you're pretty, pretty sad, aren't you? Going to be a shriveled up thing. So the on Monday, the sukkah's all green and leafy. By the end of the week, it's just, just the branches, really. You know, everything else is all shriveled and dry and look a bit manky. And the dads will teach this is son. This is what your life is like. Everything, and he they quote this from Isaiah. So this scripture is very important to Jews because they'll say, all, what does it say? All people are like the grass. They mean the grass and the sukkah. And their glory is like the, the colours of the flowers. You know, but look, remember how this booth looked on Monday? Look at it now. And they say everything in creation is like this booth. Nothing lasts, with one exception. What does it say? But the word of the living God endures forever. Okay, and by the time we get to the end of tonight, you'll understand why that's important. But just bear in mind that this is about all that festival is the very last phase of the, of the festivals to do with the second coming. So what do you think that might mean in terms of our salvation? If you've been living in a booth and now the booth has had it, where do you go? What happens at the end of living in a booth? The promised land. Yep, faith's got it. So that's what they teach. So they'll tell their sons, so just as God caused our people to live in temporary dwellings in the wilderness until they reached the promised land they couldn't build permanent homes in the wilderness so your life here is and this body is like this booth god has given you a temporary dwelling while you pass through on the way to the permanent home he has made for you so this is important that peter's referring to this and that he's a jew so this is what he's meaning that this subject is to do with making sure that you are associated not with the grass that withers not with the temporary things that don't last but with the word of god which doesn't fade doesn't die okay so have that in the back of your mind while we start to look the first thing I need to do is a bit of revision for everyone except probably Miggy and then maybe a couple of others. So I'm going to slow down slightly so you can understand what I'm saying. So to understand scripture as a Jew, you use something called Midrash, which means, does anyone know? To Midrash means means to inquire so to inquire of god what does your word mean midrash 
and it comes from a word here, daresh, which means to investigate. Okay, so midrash is to inquire. And there were various schools of thought about what the best way, best way was. But we know who God chose. There were two main schools, the, the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. God chose himself a rabbi, expert in Midrash, to help the other apostles understand the scripture. What was his name? His name was Shaul of Tarsus, and he gets a new name, Paul. But before he's a Christian, he is the star student, the expert in all Israel at this. But not any method, the method of Rabbi Hillel. So Paul went to Rabbi Hillel's Bible school and was intensely trained in Midrash. So to understand the scripture, it's really, really helpful to have even a passing. I mean, Paul will have trained for a decade. So you're not going to probably short of God working a miracle. So don't beat yourself up if you can't quite follow all this. But if you can even get a grain of an idea, it will really improve your ability to understand scripture a whole lot. So what Rabbi Hillel did is he came up with seven main rules, which, and then there's like lesser rules. And if you stick to them, it what it does is it largely eliminates the basic mistakes. You know? And we know that God inspired Rabbi Hillel because not only does Paul use this, so does Jesus. When Jesus is speaking about the scripture, Jesus sticks to carefully the way Hillel taught to explain the scripture. So if you like, Jesus was nodding in that direction. Understand the scripture like Rabbi Hillel explains it all right why are we talking about this well the first of the rules is called Cal Bahoma and as faith said it basically means light to heavy and you might think goodness what on earth does that mean I've been thinking about how to explain it, but the simplest thing is like this. If I say the rule on my boat is that you should put your life jacket on, right? Even if it's like a mill pond. So if you're on my boat, it's important to wear your life jacket. Is that true? If the weather's perfect, the water's dead flat, why do you need to wear your life jacket? Well, what if you just, for some other reason, fall off the boat into the water? Are you going to be pleased? That, or, you know, something might hit the boat, the boat might sink. So is it smart to have your life jacket on even though it's, there's not a lot of danger? Is it still smart to have the, your life jacket on if it the storm arrives and the waves are bigger than the boat. That's Kal uh, If it's true in a light situation, it's even more true in a heavy situation. Do you understand? It's the same truth, but the weight of that truth increases with the weight of the situation. And it works the other way around as well. You know? Why would this even matter? Well, it shows up in scripture all the time. And it also shows up in how Satan tries to baffle Christians. So, if I say, do not steal to someone who's got a good job and they pretty much got everything they need, you know, and... I say, oh, Maggie, don't steal. What are you going to say to me? Good rule. So easy, no problem, I can stick with that. 
But what if, what if next year you are dirt broke and the bills are coming in and you know, you're getting ready to jump off the roof and I remind you, don't steal. And there's this opportunity where, you know, maybe you find a wallet in the road with a thousand bucks in it, it's not yours. What is Satan going to whisper in your ear? <sighs> you need it. You know? You need it. No one will know. Maybe God put it there. I'll tell you about that in a sec. What does Calvary Coma tell you? If it's important not to steal when it's very unlikely that you're going to steal, it's even more important that you don't steal when the temptation is really, really real. Why? Because the enemy will be right there trying to convince you that somehow this is an exception, somehow this is different. And this idea comes through in so much of the gospel about the end times. So what I want you to understand is everything we talk about tonight was true for the people Peter spoke to. When is Peter writing? That doesn't matter about the date. In terms of Christianity, he's writing at the beginning, more or less, isn't he? Give or take. And where are we? Probably reasonably close to the end. What does this rule tell us then? It tells us that if it was important to the people that he was writing a long way from the last days, then it's even more important when we realize that we might be quite close to the last days, when, when it will take a lot more effort, a lot more deliberate will to not, you know, not pick up the wallet. The reason I, I, I'm just going to tell you briefly, you know, Elam Church and all their kooky, you know, yeah, anyway, it's another whole story. Anyway, I'm walking along Courtney Place and I see this guy coming the other way, a young guy, and I knew he was from Elam, and he waved at me and I waved at him and he's smiling away. And he, he's so happy. And I says, what are you so happy about? And he reaches in his pocket and he pulls out this wallet that's got like literally a grand in notes. You, you can hardly shut the wallet for all the money in it, right? And he goes, Look, I said, wow, that's a heap of dough. And then almost on instinct, I said, is it yours? <laughs> and he goes, I just found it. And then my eyes are glancing down and like many wallets, you know, there's that clear pocket where you, and plainly there's a driver's license in it. I can't read it, but obviously, there's a driver's license sitting there, probably in English. Probably he could read the name, probably. But he wants to tell me how he'd, especially in this family, this will make sense. He'd seen some shoes, you know, like basketball shoes or something. And they're way too expensive, he couldn't afford them. So he was, you know, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. You know, in the name of Jesus, I claim that I will have money for these shoes, right? And then he goes around the corner, there's the wallet. So in his mind, he just goes, thank you, Lord, for helping me steal this wallet. Thank you, Jesus, that you've taken this wallet off someone and left it here for me just so I can buy some mangy pair of shoes. What's wrong with this picture? Is it ever okay to steal the other guy's wallet? No. You see what I'm saying? It didn't matter that he was desperate for the shoes. It didn't matter that he was desperate for the money. It didn't make any difference actually, did it? 
what should he have done? What I told him to do. I don't know if he did, but I told him, look, it's got a driver's license. Take it to the police station. Someone will be freaking out. Not just any someone. And I took it off and pulled the driver's license out. It says, this dude here. What do you think he's praying right now? Oh, Lord, where's my mate? You know, because it might be his rent. It might be who knows what it is. And he looked at me like, huh? One of the things that put me off early on. Anyway, Calvahoma. It doesn't matter how dire the situation, the truth, the rule, the whatever it is that God has said. It doesn't change just because it, you went into a heavier situation or a weightier situation. Okay. In fact, if anything, like that example, you have to hold it more heavily. Because I'm pretty sure if I'd said to that young guy on a day when he didn't need money, should we steal, you know, if you found someone else's wallet with money in it, what would you do? I bet you he, the same guy would have said, oh, I'd take it at the police station. You know? Keep all this in the back of your mind because it's, it's much to do with what our topic is. So, at the <coughs> beginning, when this is written, there's a particular time, and it's called the time of the, what am I going to say next? Gentiles. What does this weird word mean? Who are the Gentiles? Us. Us. In Hebrew, goyim. And goy, this is plural, goy is singular. And it means the nations. Which nations? Everyone other than the Jews, other than the Jews. So in other words, a non-Jew, right? If you see there, and um, Ezekiel 30 speaks of it, prophesying that it will come, and Luke refers to it there, Luke 21, and you'll see it popping up all over the place. There's some period of time that God calls the time of the Gentiles. Can anyone tell me what really, what its uh, main characteristic is? It's sort of given the way in the, in the, na in the title. What do you think God's focus is during the time of the Gentiles? Yeah, his focus is us. Who were the first Christians? Almost exclusively Jews. You know, one or two. Can you think of one or two uh, non-Jews that turn up in the gospel really, really early? Uh, he's a Jew. He's born a, born a Gentile, be converted to Judaism already. So... What about the woman whose daughter's sick? Remember? And he says, Lord, you can save my daughter. She's dying. What does Jesus say? Don't you know that I've come for the lost sheep of Israel? And you're a... She's a Samaritan, isn't she? I think. Anyway, you're not Jewish. What are you asking me for? And she says, but even the dogs, you know, get to eat the crumbs that fall from the table. So she's acknowledging, she's not arguing with him, she's acknowledging, yes, you're the Messiah of the Jews, I understand that, but, you know, haven't you got a crumb for my daughter? She has more faith in that moment than anyone else in that Jewish room. So there's individuals dotted around that actually know he's the Messiah, or, you know, they, they recognise who he is. Yep, the centurion, remember? Yeah, the woman at the well, she's not Jewish. The centurion, he's not Jewish. So there's the odd things, but who's Jesus really preaching to and who are all his disciples? They are Jews. He's a Jew, they are Jews. But once the, once the crucifixion happens, what, remember what day he's resurrected on? You were going to say the third day which is true, what's the third day on the Jewish calendar after, what day is he crucified on? Passover, right? Pesach. So, see if you can remember this in the morning. On the first day 
after the first Sabbath after Passover, you shall go and harvest the first of the what harvest? First of the barley harvest. And you shall come and wave it before the Lord in the temple. And this shall be the, the feast of first fruits. Thanksgiving for the first fruits of the spring. The barley ripens before the wheat. The first fruit is barley. And if you go back to the book of Ruth, you get a guy who's harvesting barley. And when he's doing it, someone's helping him. And he sees her. Her name is it's Ruth. <laughs> it's a book of Ruth. <laughs> that was a trick question. And remember, at night, she's cold, and he says, even though this is his land, this is his threshing floor, and he, so he's a powerful Jewish man, what does he say? Come and sleep at my feet. Isn't it? And he, and he extends his blanket over her. So this is a picture of a powerful Jewish man who takes pity on the gentile woman and he goes one step further. What does he say next? Marry me. The powerful Jewish ruler takes himself a gentile bride and the proposal happens on the barley harvest floor. So Jesus is resurrected on that same, on the day that is most important to do with the barley harvest. In Midrash, it tells you that there has to be a connection. So what would you expect Boaz represents? Who's Boaz pointing to? What is he? He's the guy that owns the field. He's the guy that owns the threshing floor. He's the powerful Jewish ruler. And what does he do on the, at the barley harvest? He takes himself a gentile bride which is the beginning of the time of the gentiles and so all this time including up to now numerically you would expect exactly what you got that most christians are do not start jewish because we are in the like of ruth can anyone remember ruth said something to naomi when naomi was old your people will be my people your god my god what was she doing she was grafting herself into naomi's people you know that's what jesus does with us you know he takes us of the wild branch and grafts us into the jewish tree it's the same thing midrash but this is going to end turn over to page two heard like to Who'd like to read Jeremiah 30, verse 4 to verse 7? It's not much. Raniel, do you want to have a verse of that? Uh, <clears throat> These are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard, terror, not peace. Ask and see, can a man bear children? Then why do... I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor. Every face turned deathly pale. How awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will save <clears throat> but he will be saved out of it. One of the can I rub this off? I get I think I can. Um one of the two main two key things that you see in there. I highlighted them, I think. The two things about the time of Jacob's trouble is, firstly, whose trouble is it? Jacob's. And secondly, there's something about the trouble. I think I did, yeah. I put it in bigger letters. What is it? None other like it. When this is fulfilled, it will be the worst day the worst thing that will ever happen in human history without exception. So you know those people 
that I sometimes mention the dominionists that like to think that the kingdom's already here, therefore we should be behaving as if we were little gods already, like how it will be in the millennium. One of the things they like to say is that the things that are happen at the end, like the you know the abomination that causes desolation has to be set up in the temple, according to Daniel, that happened in 70 AD. But what didn't happen is everything that Daniel said didn't happen, only some things. But because that happened, it was a, it was a Roman... Um, a Roman emperor, well he's a general then, but he became the emperor, but he, when he burnt the temple down, before he did, he had a statue of himself made and installed in the holy place. You know? So, you know, you have to worship me as God, which is what Antichrist will do. So that's foreshadowing Antichrist, but Dominionist thinks, oh, see, no, no, that was all fulfilled then, so this is the kingdom now. This is one of the scriptures that tells you that can't be. Because when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, they killed about, it's hard to know for sure, but top figure would be a million people. And they scat took the rest of the slaves away, right? But they actually killed about a million people, including most of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and just about all of the priests. Right? And then they burnt the temple down. They said accidentally afterwards, but funny how they got all the golden treasure out of it first. If you know any history at all, if that is, if that was the fulfilment, and about a million Jews died, who knows a little bit of more modern history to do with lots of Jews dying? The Holocaust in the 1940s. How many Jews died there? Six million, right? Here's the thing you don't know, is that possibly even more than that died under Joseph Stalin at the same time. He was a rampant anti-Semite. And the Holocaust in the Soviet Union kept going right into the 60s. Right? But even if you're just talking about the Nazis, the number of Jews killed in the 1940s vastly exceeds the number of Jews killed in Jerusalem back in AD 70. So it cannot have been the fulfillment of these scriptures because when it happens, it will eclipse even that, even the Holocaust. It will completely eclipse that. So much so that Zechariah 13 tells us that of all the Jews remaining alive in the world, only one third will survive. That Antichrist will kill two thirds of the entire world Jewish population. That's slightly foreshadowed by the Holocaust. Two thirds of all the Jews in Europe were killed. One third survived. So it's the same ratio as in scripture. Right? But it was just in Europe. Thankfully, most of the Jewish population of the world lived in the US. <laughs> so, largely, and in Africa. But anyway, that's another thing. So a time is coming. Does Jesus mention it? Yes, he does. Matthew 24, which as you know, is all about the end times. I'll read this one. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Let those who are in, who are in Judea. Where's Judea? He, he says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. What do you think Jesus means by those who are in Judea? Huh? Well, what Western Christians do is they think, oh, the Jews rejected the Messiah, but we didn't. So somehow... Everything that was spoken to the Jews just means us now? You know that we've replaced them? No. One of the rules of Midrash is, we'll cover it again in a second, is the plain meaning is always the meaning. Where is Judea? Well, I can't draw Israel because I'm hopeless at it's roughly like that. 
Egypt down here, um, Jordan there, Syria there, ocean there. Judea is about like that. And then the most important, what's there? Jerusalem. The capital of Judea is Jerusalem. Because, why is it called Judea? Because it belonged to the tribe of Judah, or Yehuda, to use his proper name. And what do all the prophets say about the tribe of Yehuda? Out of you will come one who will rule, one like unto David, your king. You know, God put his temple in the middle of Judah. The Messiah comes from Judah, the tribe of Judah. Okay? Jesus means exactly what it says. If you are here, when you see this happen in the temple, it's got nothing to do with us. If we're in New Zealand, we're not in Judah. You understand? This is an, a case where you have to read the scripture as it's written. So this is a warning to who then? Gentiles? Jews. Those who, are, who will be alive Literally, in Judah, he says, when you see this happen in the temple, run. Run. Flee to the mountains. Let no one go on, let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. What does that remind you of? From Israel's history. Yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah. What did, the, what did the two angels say to Lot and his family? Run. Don't look back. Run. Do it now. If you delay at all, you will die. Don't even look back. So for a Jewish audience, that's the first thing that would have gone ping in their head. Jesus is saying, you know that story. If you see, when you see this happen in the temple, if you're in Judea, Leg it. Do it quickly. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For there, for then there will be a great distress. What does it say next? Unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. The time of Jacob's trouble is what Jesus is talking about. He's quoting from the scriptures. He's quoting from Jeremiah. He's saying, remember, a time is coming that will be so bad for who? Jacob. Your next question should be, who the heck is Jacob? So who can tell me who Jacob is? Backslid in Israel, perfect answer. But it's just so everyone can keep up. Who is Jacob in an ordinary sense? Who's his, who's his dad? And who's his dad? Abraham. And then this guy here, Jacob. And then he has a couple of kids, right? How many? Twelve. Who become the twelve tribes that we call Israel it gets really confusing these terms Israel how many different Israel are there? if I write to you you'll see this even in English especially if you go traveling and that's Israel what what is this 
I gave you a clue if you go traveling. What is this? This is Hebrew for the land of Israel. This is a place, real estate. So if you live there, does that make you an Israeli? Not necessarily. You just live in Eretz Israel. It's a place. But what makes you Israeli? How do you get to be that? Well, all you need is a passport. You can be born in Germany, you can be German, but if you hang around in Israel long enough and get an Israeli passport, that makes you Israeli. Also, in Israel are lots of Muslims born there. Guess what passport they have? Israeli. They are Israeli. Muslim Israelis. There are Christian Israelis. There are Buddhist Israelis. But mostly, most Israelis are secular. They don't have any religion at all. The most common religion in Israel, in Eretz Israel, is no religion today. What other, common, what other Israels are there? Let's get on to, there's a few, but we'll, we'll speed it up. This is the most important one. There is the Israel of God. That's a saying. And there is, what am I going to put here? I'll put this guy, Jacob. And we have to understand what he's doing there. So, in Genesis 32, at a spring at a place called Jabbok, Jacob, who will be the father of all the 12 tribes, he sends his wife and possessions and things across the thing, but he waits, he delays, right? And night comes, and a man appears. And what do these two do? They wrestle. How long does the wrestling last? It's Jacob and this man who's very strong. Jacob's no weakling himself, right? And they wrestle and they wrestle and they wrestle. How long does the wrestling last? The whole night, right through the night. But in the morning, as the sun is about to come up, what happens? Who's watched the sports? Who knows how this match ends? Why is Jacob limping at the end of it? Why? What does the man do? Where? Yeah, actually, it's right there. The thickest part of the thickest bone, the strongest bone in your body is your thigh bone. The strongest part of your thigh bone is right at the top next to your hip. You know that has your ball joint attached to it? So this is the strongest, physically the strongest part of your entire body is right there. And how did the man break it? With a big club or something or a massive rock? What does it say in the scripture? It might have been a long time since you read this. How does he break it? Yeah, Ronyal knows. I break Holly's shoulder like he did. That's what he does. He touched it. He just touches it. And the strongest part of his tent, his sukkah, is shattered. Ever after, he walks with a limp. So he breaks him at his strongest place and ever after he walks with a limp there. But the wrestling stops, but the man says to him, you have wrestled with man and with God. Therefore, I am going to give you a new name. What new name is Jacob given? Israel. Everywhere in scripture, especially in the prophets, because sometimes when you're trying to read the prophets, as you're reading down, one minute they're talking about Jacob, and then they're talking about Israel, then they're talking about Jacob again, and it's like, it's always the same guy. When it talks about Jacob, it's talking about that stubborn guy who's wrestling in the dark. But when it uses Israel, 
it's talking about the same guy, but when he's been broken, when he's been subdued by the one wrestling with him, when the sun comes up, when the light appears, and when he's behaving like that, he's called Israel. Who do you think he's wrestling with? Who's he wrestling with? Jesus, yeah. It's Jesus in the Old Testament. How do you know it's Jesus? If you, can you wrestle with a spirit? Can you wrestle with a ghost? It says he wrestles with a man. But it also says that the man was God. When God appears in the flesh, solid, as a man, that's the word of God in the flesh. That's Jesus. Jesus is in the Old Testament. He's all over the Old Testament, actually. So the first coming is probably not very well named. <laughs> that's the first time he came as the Messiah, but it wasn't as actually his first appearance. So Jacob gives that place at the spring of Jabbok, he gives it a place, a new name, Peniel, which means the face of El, God. Be and he says, because there I saw God face to face and lived. Remember how Moses couldn't see, you know, God said, hide your face because no one can stand to see me face to face. So, you know, Jacob can't believe that he's wrestled with God and lived. He's wrestling with Jesus. What does it tell you about your salvation? Before he can save you, he has to break you. But when he's broken you, you will ever have to walk with a limp at that place usually where you were strongest before. You know, God will always, Jesus will always zero in on the place where you're able to be most self-reliant. And he will make you reliant on him there. So he wrestles when? In the night. Is it, what does the night mean in scripture? absence of light so when it's like night to you when god seems far away you know it's your time of trouble it's your time of wrestling in the dark god is usually has one thing in mind he wants to break you at your strongest place where you tend to rely on yourself to cause you to rely on him there instead and guess what that wound won't heal you will walk with a limp there <laughs> You know but he changed his name he made him a new person what does he do for us he makes us a new creation someone who lets Jesus break them bring them into submission to him becomes a new creation okay so when we talk about the time of Jacob's trouble it's exactly what Rania was saying. Jacob isn't just talking about the Jews. It's talking about a particular kind of Jew. What kind of Jew? Stubborn. Self-reliant. Still trying to wrestle with God. Refusing to submit. The easy word for that is unsaved. What do you call a Jew who has been broken, submitted? What do you call a Jew who has given in to God? Not a trick question. You call them a Christian. <laughs> Remember what Paul says? There is no longer male or female, Jew or Gentile, but just Christ in all and all in Christ. You're either a Christian or you're not. doesn't matter what you were before. You see? That's what the Israel of God is. This and this are related. Unsaved people are like Jacob. But when it says Jacob in the scripture, it specifically means unsaved Jews. People who've wrestled with God until the morning... You know, he's, let they, he's broken them until they're just reliant on him. He calls them, 
Israel, whether you started Jewish or not, doesn't matter. Spiritual Israel, the Israel that counts, is made up of everyone who has stopped being Jacob. The Israel of God is Christians. Jewish Christians, you know, Jewish-born Christians, Gentile-born Christians, Christians. So the time of Jacob's trouble is specifically Jewish. It happens in Judea, as Jesus says. It's nothing to do with us. Why, why do you think it would still be important to us? We're not literally going to be in that Matthew 24 situation because we're, gen, you know, we, we're not actually Jacob, never have been. Why is it still important to us? Because just as everything that happened to Israel points to what will happen to the whole of mankind, what happens to Israel at the end is, will also be foreshadowed in the church. So though we won't be part of the actual time of Jacob's trouble, we will experience something a bit like it. You know, it won't be the worst thing ever, because the worst thing ever is the real, actual. But we should expect trouble to come that will either break you or make you. Does anyone know what we call that time? Starts with T. Tribulation. Tribulation. What happens in the world? What starts to happen? Wars. Earthquakes, famines, persecutions, you know? It becomes, again, really, really hard to survive on the planet unless you are already broken. God protects his own in the middle of it. But if you are still an unsaved Gentile, you will have something not as extreme as the real time of Jacob's trouble, but it will probably feel as bad to you. You won't know what's going on. The world will start to really come apart. But the peak of it, the climax of it, is when the time of Jacob's trouble actually arrives. So you ask yourself, well, what's this got to do with anything? It's that Calvahoma thing. He's saying these things to people who are back in the time of the Gentiles, where it's relatively easy. We're living much closer to the time of Jacob's trouble. So whatever he has to say will be even more important for us to cling tightly to than it was for the original audience. Because on the time scale, we're closer to the scary thing than to the beginning, you know? Because like I say, although we won't actually go through that because we're not Jewish, there's like spillover, you know? We get caught up in the beginnings of it, which will be bad enough. So let's look at what Peter starts and says. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus comes again. What kind of mind should you have? Be fully alert and fully sober. What's the difference between alert and sober? Is there a difference? Alert is to do with prioritizing. A, a good, clear mind, but that's on something else, is not alert to the danger. You know, if someone said, stand guard here because a bad guy's coming, but there's, you know, you've got your iPhone. So you might be stone cold sober, but you're like prioritizing the iPhone. What kind of century are you? Well, eventually probably a dead one, you know? Because you didn't stay alert because you let yourself be distracted. What about sober then? 
What's it sobriety about? What does it mean in ordinary English? Not drunk, right? Sober. So you should make sure that you are capable of being alert because you haven't let your life, your brain, whatever, get so befuddled with junk. In the scripture, it talks about drunkenness as a spiritual thing. Drunkenness is, relate, is related to being possessed of an evil spirit through following false religion. Okay? Being out of control. What's the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Sound mind and self-control. Drunkenness is being out of control. Okay? So we're supposed to be these two things. Not only making sure our mind's in a good state because we are, you know, meditating on the word, things like that, but we need to be prioritised, not so that we're alert, you know, we're actually on the job. And again, Calva Homer, if it was important then, it becomes even more important now. Look what Jesus says here. There's another Midrash rule just for Mickey's sake. Something that happens in Hebrew writing all the time is they use contrast. So they will explain what something is by contrasting it with what it isn't. And you'll see Jesus do that here in Mark 13. He says about, he's talking about when he comes back, about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. And again, he says the same thing here, be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away, he leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned tasks, and he tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore keep watch, because you don't know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. Can anyone tell me, in terms of light, something that has all those four things have in common? It's the beginning of when it gets dark, the two quarters, midnight, and when the rooster crows, that's midnight and three, and when the darkness ends. So it, so you don't know whether he'll come when the darkness is beginning, when it's at its, like the day is halfway, three o'clock's the darkest time, or at the dawn when the darkness is ending. That's what he's talking about. What's the darkness? It's the tribulation, where God seems to have disappeared. Remember a time will come when no one can work, where the Holy Spirit will withdraw? Darkness. It's the time for Antichrist comes out and play. That's the beginning of the night. You know, and at the peak of the night is the time of Jacob's trouble. We don't know. So when should we be on watch? All the time. When should you be ready? All the time. Because if he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone. So everyone includes us. Look at the Matthew 24 version. It's the same. It's just Matthew's version, the same one. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants of his household? to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites and there will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Jesus is contrasting. This is the outcome for the good servant who stays alert. This is the outcome for the one that goes, Ah, oh, Jesus, you're a long time coming back. Maybe I could just party for a while. 
maybe I can just go back to the world for a while. Maybe it won't matter if I don't go to church and I don't read my Bible and, you know. And when I see you coming, then I'll rush back and get back on it. Lots of people do that. What does Jesus say is the problem with that? I won't tell you when I'm coming. I'll turn up at an hour you least expect me. It's the same message in the parable of the five wise and unwise versions. You know, the five that were ready from the beginning and stayed ready, they get to go in. The other five end up shut out. It's that contrasting. Do what I say, it's all good. Don't do what I say, sad. Make sense? So, if this was important then, Calvahoma, remember? Light too heavy. It becomes even more important when the signs of the times tell us we are much closer to the night. You know, we are much closer to that end time. It's not the time to go slack, it's a time to be more alert, more sober. Does that make sense? Then Peter says that we should set our hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus is revealed. This is confusing in English. Can anyone tell me what is this grace that Jesus is bringing? Aren't we already saved by grace? Hasn't he already given us grace? So what is this grace that he's going to bring when he returns? That's what it says, isn't it? Set your hope on the grace that he's going to bring when he comes. What, it's no grace now? What does it mean? Well, you have to understand the original is written in what language? Greek. And the Greek word that gets always translated as grace is... Charis, from which you get charismatic or charisma. <laughs> Just put that in there. What does it mean? It actually means, if we talk about charismatic or charisma, we normally like think of Corinthians 12, that the Spirit gives charisma to the body. What is it? Gifts. The actual word, charis, means gift. Hence, charismatic churches are churches that concentrate on the gifts of the Spirit. Charis actually means gift, but since the biggest gift God gives us is grace, your Bible translates this, as grace, but it doesn't make sense in English, does it? So put that, read it again as gift. <coughs> now what does it say? Set your minds, uh, be alert and fully sober. Set your hope on the gift to be brought to you when Jesus is revealed at his coming. Now it makes sense. What gift are you hoping for? Salvation. What other gift are you hoping for? Remember, you're betrothed. What other gift are you hoping for? You've got the engagement ring. Should we ask the expert? You've got the engagement ring, Marivak. What were you hoping for next? Wedding, Wedding ring. It's, it's as simple as that. You know, you were brought into the covenant, therefore you are betrothed. The thing that should be exciting you, the thing that should be motivating you, keeping you alert and willing to, you know, is you've got your hope set on, you know, there's room for one more ring on here. This engagement ring's nice, but, you know, I've got a long finger, I can fit another one. You're hoping for the wedding, actual salvation, actual eternal life, actual, actual, the gift that only Jesus can give because he's the groom. You know? So that's what he's saying. Set your hope on the charis, gift, that Jesus will bring for those who are his. Right? Now we move on. One 
on the bottom of page 3, 1 Peter 1, 14. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as you were called, uh, just, sorry, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. He's quoting Leviticus 11 and Leviticus 19. So it says that we're supposed to be obedient children and to be holy. So we have to be obedient and holy. That's two things, right? No. Next Midrash lesson, for just so you're catching up again. In Hebrew writing, if you want to emphasize something, like I've put here in English, what do we do? We can type in capitals or we can hit bold. So if I want to make sure you really, you know, I'm writing all the stuff, but I want you to really see this bit, I can put the whole thing in capitals or I could use bold, right? In Hebrew, what you do is you repeat the message again, but you just use different words. But you repeat the idea. And you know the Psalms? How they sound a bit like poetry, but they don't rhyme. Jewish poetry doesn't repeat sound. You know, English poetry repeats the sound. That's what we call rhyming, isn't it? So the next line should sound a bit like, like musically, should, when you say it out loud, it should sound a bit like the previous line, rhyming. In Hebrew, it's not like that. In Hebrew, the next line should say the same thing as the previous line, even though it's using different words. So Hebrew poetry repeats the idea, not the sound of the words. What Peter just did is he used that Hebrew way of writing to tell you that what I just wrote is super important. You should be obedient children. You should be holy. He just said the same thing two different ways. He just put it in bold, Hebrew style. Therefore, it's super important. What's the first thing you can say then? What is it to be holy? To be an obedient child of who? Your dad, your mum? They'd like that. But pr primarily it means be an obedient child of God. What do you call obedient children of God? Disciples. So being holy is absolutely entwined with being a disciple. You can't be holy unless you're a disciple. The two are hand in hand, you can't be separated. And God commanded it because, be holy because what? I am holy. So you know that it's got something to do with being the same as him. He says, you should do it because I do it. You be holy because I am. Remember what we just said about discipleship? What does Jesus say about students and teachers? A student is not above his teacher. It is enough if what? you end up just like them. Jesus is our rabbi. We are his Talmudim, that's the Hebrew for disciple, right? Student. He's telling us how to be holy. God's saying, be like me. Jesus is saying, you don't know how to do that, so I'm here. Be like me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You can't be omnipotent, omniscient, and all that, you know, you can't be exactly like my father, but you can be like me, because I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to allow you to be really, really different to the world. If you really are serious about being a disciple, I will make it possible for you to be like this guy standing in front of you, your Rabbi, Rabbi Yeshua. That's what he's saying to his disciples. Be holy. That's what it looks like on page four. Let's see what it looks like in practice to us. Uh, Rainy, are you up for Colossians 13? Oh, Col is it three? Sorry, Colossians three. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is 
seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, <clears throat> and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, mal malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in, the, in knowledge in the image of its creator. What is it to be holy? It's what it says here in Colossians 3. You cannot stay like you were. What you were is Jacob. What you were is like the world. No different, indiscernible from the world. Sexually immoral, you know, even in your thoughts, if not your actions. Greedy. Your whole focus is on here and now, this world, how to get more, you know, just like the rest of the world. What's he saying? If you stay like the rest of the world, you'll get what the rest of the world is going to get. But I've made a way for you to leave that. You have to put that off. Who has to put it off? Us. Now, can you do that in your own strength? No. That's why unsafe people can't be good. They have moments of good, but they can't keep it up because without the Holy Spirit, your nature just continually takes over because human nature is fallen. It's incapable of, you know, functioning permanently in any kind of righteous way. Look at the list of things you need to get rid of. And you go, oh yeah, that all makes sense, but you'd be astonished if you're really honest with yourself how much of these are a real problem even for Christians all the time. Okay, all the time. Nevertheless, we have to get rid of them. Can anybody tell me how to get rid of a serious problem in our character? And the one I've picked on is sexual immorality because it's such a problem really in the world and the churches now, right? And let's see what Paul, the rabbi, has to say about that. And he's writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 7, and he says, Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I do. But if you can't control yourself, what does he mean? He means sexually. If you can't control yourself, you should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. What is Paul saying? He's saying this. If you can just, in your own strength, deal with something, if you can go, I can live without that, sweet. But if it's something that your own nature, it's too strong, you know? You can't push it off, or you might push it off for a bit, but it keeps coming back. And, you know, anyone who's recovering from, like, drugs or alcohol or something like that, I'll tell you all about this, right? If you just keep trying to undress from that wrong thing, if I just undress, and tr thankfully I won't be doing that, so what would I be? Naked. If you're standing around naked, you are unarmored, aren't you? You're just a target. That's not what God instructs us to do. What does he tell us to do? I think I might have put it on... Did I put it here? I thought I did. Mm -hmm. oh, anyway, we're told we're to put off our old nature and put on Christ. We have to make an exchange. You don't just try pushing the old off and then standing naked. 
you have to put one thing off and the other thing on. And you've only got so much energy, so guess which you're supposed to expend your energy on. You put your energy into putting on Christ. The more you do that, the Holy Spirit will just, if you like, bulldoze. The Holy Spirit wants to dress you. So the Holy Spirit will do for you what an unsaved person can't do. As you are putting on Christ, he will be stripping off to make room, to make way for the new clothes. He will be peeling off what he wants gone. And who knows, who knows that rule about sweeping a room empty? Yeah, so Jesus is talking about deliverance, right? So if, a, if there's an evil spirit in a house, and you sweep that house clean, but you leave it empty. What does Jesus say will happen? After a while, that spirit will come back and seeing that the house is empty, will go away and get seven other spirits much worse than itself and return. And the state of that person will be much worse at the end than at the beginning. What's the meaning of the parable? It's what I'm talking about. You are not supposed to just keep trying to sweep evil out of your life because all you're doing is leaving in the room empty. You're supposed to put your effort into filling the room with the better thing. Then that will not only drive the bad thing out, but when it comes back for a look, it finds the house occupied by God. <laughs> and there's no point going getting help because he just goes, can't beat that, you know? In simple terms, what we're told to do is be focused on putting on the likeness of Christ, which is, how do you do that? Discipleship, how do you do that? Be obedient children. So every time you have a choice, you make the Jesus choice, What would, like you do at Sunday school. If you don't know what to do, ask yourself, what would Jesus do here? Do that. You know? What does the scripture say about that, about if you can think of it? Obey that. Especially, especially if it's a heavy situation. Remember? Because it becomes more important, not less. We are to put off. Now, going back to our unmarried people, it's better that you marry. That's what he's saying. If you're like trying to, you know, just be good, just be good, but it's no. Then he says, though it's advantageous if you're single, and I'll cover that in a second because you probably think that's crazy. If you can't, it's better that you get married than end up in a complete mess because you're trying to live in a room swept clean all the time and it just gets, the whole thing just escalates and gets worse and worse and worse until it end in something terrible right why does paul say it's better to be unmarried next rule of midrash remember you always have to understand the context the context of this letter as he's talking about ministry and you'll pick it up if you go down a few verses and i'll just put it in in case you're thinking god doesn't want me to be married context verse 32 i would like you to be free from concern an unmarried man, he's talking to men principally, an unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs and how he can please God. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, Daryl. And his interests are divided. Because if you are married, God requires you to prioritise or you know, to balance your your wife, your family. You have responsibilities in Christ for that. So if you say, oh, I'm sorry, dear, um, I can't do this because I just need to read my Bible 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day, so you do everything and I'll just read because I'm very righteous. No, God will give you a thorough spanking for that. 
is what Paul's saying. So that's the, that's the basis on which he's saying it's better that you don't marry. It's in the context of if you want to be in ministry or fruitful, then it's advantageous to be single. Because as soon as you're married, you have these other concerns that you're not allowed to ignore. You know, so you have less time than you had when you were single to serve God. That's all he's talking about. But do you get the example of what Paul's saying? Don't leave the room swept clean. The answer is to go for the sanctified the, the sanctified uh, solution, what God has provided for that. You know? What about if you're desperately poor and there's just no work and there's just no money? You know, because if you're desperately poor, you need money. What sanctified solution has God given for that? Because, you know, back in the Philippines, it's a real thing. But if you think about how happy people in the church are there, what have they done that allows them to be so happy with no money while people in the churches here are so miserable with lots of money? What's the sanctified solution? You work out the difference between need and want. You work out the difference between what's eternal and what's just temporal. And you work out that it's good to pray and ask God for the things that you'd like but you don't need. You still go and asking, but you tell yourself, actually, I don't need that, and I can be happy without it. And actually, if God can get you to keep your life super simple, you know, uncluttered by all that, then you will be profoundly more happy, I assure you. That's why with Western society has such high suicide rates and everything. Because the more stuff you have, the more you worry about, the more you worry about, the more you think you need more stuff, which gives you more stuff to worry about, which means makes you think you need more stuff. And then your friends come over and say, oh, oh, what are you talking about? You just need one of these that you don't have. Go get that. Then you'll be happy till it breaks. Then you'll worry again. There is some guy sitting in his Nipa hut watching his rice grow. He's got everything he needs and none of those worries. You know? Try and keep your life as uncluttered as you can. You'll be very happy that you did. So the next point there is, even though you're a Christian, you're still a human being. You will be tempted. Holiness has nothing to do with never having unholy thoughts. Never having an unholy thought means you've died. You are a corpse. You know? If you're never tempted, you're dead. So holiness is not about, you know, some sort of, I don't know, strange, some strange hippie dream in which I float through the world and, the, you know, happiness and light and you know, pure thoughts and, oh, you know, skipping through the fields. No. Real Christians struggle with real temptations and real sins. Holiness is about what you do about those things. The holy person turns to God's response to them. Every Christian has the same temptations as everybody else. What do you, why is that beneficial to know? Well, especially when you're young, if you think that all these other really holy people next to you in church aren't having the same struggles as you, it can really get you down. And you can think, oh, I'm not, I'm not working out as a Christian. You know? Oh, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I know people like this that worry themselves almost to the grave. They don't realise that every single other person in the place is struggling with exactly the same things. Okay. The difference is that you are the obedient child. So when these things happen, you choose the God answer. You choose as far as it's up to you. You follow his example or you turn to what he says to do. That's what God considers righteous. Because the world doesn't, like our mate with the shoes, you know? 
Didn't have enough money for the shoes. Oh look, here's a wallet I can steal, appropriate. You know. Let's shoot over. Oh, just before we do, right at the bottom of page four, Hebrews 12. Make every effort. What does make every effort mean? It means as far as it's up to you. So the amount of effort will be different person to person. It just means as far as you're able, it's a personal thing. You know? So there's no fixed amount. It just means you make every effort that you can make to live at peace with everyone and to be holy. Now the important one. Without holiness, no one will see God. How many is no one? Zero. Holiness is critical. Holiness is to be set apart, to be an obedient son, to be a disciple. So if you don't set yourself to do those things, this is what I'm doing, not what God's doing. This is about me. If I don't do those things, you will have an earthly life. You will have an ordinary human life. You won't see God in your life, even if you go to church. And church is full of people like this. So I never see God do anything. You should try being a disciple then. That, give that a go. Really? You know? Right, flipping over to page five, because we'll skip along now. Verse 17 of 1 Peter 1. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. It's so going to stop there because of the time. What does it say we are? Foreigners. What's a foreigner? What's a foreigner, just in general terms? Yeah, you know, you're, you being here is unnatural. It's not really your home, right? So what's he telling us? We should treat our lives on earth as if we were foreigners in another land. This is not your home. For those of you who've been around me longer, what does the book of Exodus tell you about that? The, the whole book, the purpose of the whole book? If, you were, if someone said, what's that book of Exodus about? What would you tell them? What does Exodus mean? Exit, right? To leave one place and go to another, right? What's the book of Exodus mostly about? The wilderness journey. So they already left Egypt. They're no longer slaves in Egypt, but they are not yet in the promised land. They are in the wilderness on the way. Is the wilderness home? No. So they are foreigners in the wilderness, just passing through on their way home. And everything God does with Israel there, he gives them the law, so he teaches them about himself. He, every day he gives them manna, you know, water from the rock, all those things. The midrush of all that is all pointing to Christ, which, again, if you've been around me long enough, you'll know those things. But, but in its most basic thing, Exodus tells you about this thing we're doing now, life this life this is not heaven but if you're a christian you already left your personal egypt you're no longer a slave to satan's kingdom you know so you left that but you are not yet home you are on the way you are in the middle of your personal wilderness journey along with everyone else walking along with you going who's also going through the same wilderness heading home so collectively we are foreigners there we shouldn't ever treat it as home if you realize it's the wilderness you it allows you to actually see it as god does a place that's not that attractive why would you want to build a permanent home here you know you know what the world's really like do you want to live in this world forever? If I said, uh, here, take this pill and you'll never die. The only thing is, you'll be in this world forever. Who's seen those, um, that Scottish dude and he couldn't die? You know, he had a sword. What was that film called? Highlander. Highlander. Who's seen that movie, Highlander? 
and they were these immortals, you know, they were like immortal men, and they'd just lived for centuries and centuries, and they had to keep reinventing to explain why they never get older, so they couldn't marry anybody, because, you know, their wives would get old, grey, and die, and they'd still be 20, because they just didn't, but the whole theme of the movie was they all wanted to die, you know, they couldn't stand this world because, of course, they'd been forced to watch all the horrible things of history and constantly be stuck in the middle of all the evil of men. But they couldn't leave because they couldn't die. And the reason I'm talking about that is you wouldn't want this to be where eternity happens. Would you? This is just the difficult place that we need to pass through to where we want to have eternity, where there's no sin, no death, no tears. You know, not here. So that's what he's talking about. We should live as foreigners with reverent fear. What does reverent fear mean? The better word, well, it's not a better word, but if, to help you understand it simply, just insert the word respect. Why? Respect who? The one he mentions at the beginning. Since you are called, since you call on a father who judges who? Everyone. With impartiality. What does impartiality mean? Well, to understand that, just drop your eyes down a smidge. The Deuteronomy 10, verse 16. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked, that means stubborn, any longer. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords and the great and mighty and awesome God who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. So he'd never, ever be any good as a Philippine president, would he? Hopeless. So, what does impartial mean? What is God's character? He's so pure in his character and so pure in his judgment, even though he loves everyone, he judges everyone by exactly the same rules, exactly the same standard. He shows no favoritism. That's why there's no advantage to being born Jewish if you're a Christian. No favoritism. You're either a disciple or you're not. He loves the worst of sinners. He wants to save them. But that won't stop him throwing them into the lake of fire because come the judgment, he is unable by nature to bend the rules. His rules, his own rules. He just won't do it. He won't take a bribe. When Jesus is tested in the wilderness, Remember, Satan takes him to a high place and says, do you see all these kingdoms of the world? What does he say next? Just bow down to me and I will give you rule over all these kingdoms. What do you call that? Bribe. All you're going to do is bow down. Come on, man. Look what I'm going to give you. You know, I'll even throw in Churton Park. You know? What does Jesus say? No. No. He doesn't have to think about it. Why? Because he's God. He cannot be bribed. He won't make an exception to his rule. Right? That's slightly scary. It's supposed to be. That's what Peter's saying. We need to acknowledge that that's who our Father is. And though we have this great relationship and we can call on everything else, we have to keep in mind that's who Dad is. And the judgment day will involve judgment in which even though we're his children, well, you know, even though he loves us, wants to save us, he can't have one rule for this person, different rule for the other. What is his rule book? It's the... Scripture, the Word. He judges according 
to the word. Jesus says this exactly. He says, the very words I'm speaking to you will judge you at the end. You know? So the only basis for judgment is his own word. No exceptions. Look what it says next though. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. You are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourself were foreigners in Egypt. How does that sound in the New Testament? Love your neighbours yourself. Love your enemies. Do good to those who don't do good to you. Why? Because once you were one of those people not doing good. Do you see how there's nothing new in the New Testament? That rule that Jesus gives in the New Testament is from Deuteronomy. It's the law. There's nothing new in the New Testament. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in. So because we know that everyone is going to be judged by the same standard, by the same judge, although we have this special relationship, we must proceed with a kind of reverence, you know, a kind of clarity of understanding that he's still God. You know, as much as he's our rabbi and, our, you know, our betrothed, and it's all very romantic, but we have to never lose sight of the fact that he's a holy and righteous God that requires us to be holy. Now, down the bottom, verse 22 of 1 Peter 1. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, the love there, you have guessed already, the word is agape. Do you understand the different love words? Because I can tell it, otherwise I'll, no? She can explain. So you know agape me has got nothing to do with emotion, right? So agape is the love that delights in the truth and hates evil. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. It's that love. We are to love one another deeply from the heart, or in some of the old manuscripts it says, with a pure heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Last page. I won't spend the time. You can just read that first bit on the last page at home. But remember Rabbi Hillel's rules? When you read something, there's something called the Pesha meaning. Right? And in English, you would call this the, the plain meaning. And although the Holy Spirit will give you deeper interpretation and show you how that applies to other things and that's your um, that's Daresh and Sod and that's the other th what, um, things that follow from Pesha we can recover this again sometime but the first meaning the Pesha meaning in English we would just say the plain meaning so Rabbi Hillel said the Pesha meaning, in other words, just what it says, plainly, is the meaning. All those other things, like the, you know, like this sort of mystically implies something else, it's all valid in its place. But it will never change. The plain meaning is always what God meant. You know? Why is that important today? Because of Dan Brown and the Bible Code and all this other nonsense. It's got people thinking that scripture doesn't mean what it says, that it's some kind of code, that it's really secretly saying something else. Pesha, the plain meaning is the meaning. We have to apply that here. Verse 22, now that you have purified, what does it say next? Yourselves by obeying the truth. How do you purify yourself? By obeying the truth. Who is yourself? Yeah, perfect answer. All of you should point and go, me. So whose job is this? Mine. Not even your neighbor, not even your, you know? There's, 
this awkward thing that the church doesn't like to mention part of salvation is our job part of becoming holy is down to us do you understand why should we be so concerned about this in the days we live in if you go to most churches most churches they will tell you that jesus is just going to do it to you that's what they teach or worse that he's already done it that you're already finished you know you're already saved just as you are either either version they lull you into thinking there's nothing you need to do nothing could be further from the truth peter is big on this paul's big on this jesus is big on this how to understand it oh just before we do have a look at revelation 22 look i am coming soon my reward is with me and i will give to each person according to what they have what does it say next done what's done action who did it jesus no them according to what they did does that mean jesus isn't part of it no no he's doing his thing this is about our thing i am the alpha and the omega the first and the last the beginning and the end blessed are those who wash their robes so that they might have the right to the tree of life and go through the gates into the city blessed are those who what who's washing their robes Blessed are those people who wash their robes. It's them. They wash their robes. But in church, they'll say, oh, I'm washed by the blood of the Lamb, or I'm just, you know, the idea that he's just going to do it to me, and as soon as I get out of church, yep, yeah, do it to me, Lord, do it to me, Lord, and hurry, please, because, like, my girlfriend's waiting for me at the pub, and I've got to go, and then, you know. No. We have our part to play. How to understand it. You remember that the you remember that the whole covenant is that betrothal contract? In a wedding contract, there are things the groom promises to do, and there are things the bride promises to do. We can count that Jesus will do everything in the covenant, Messiah has to do that's his job but we have to do if we want to be the bride we have to do the bits that are the bride's bits to do put off your old nature put on christ as far as that's up to you be obedient be holy don't be like the world be set apart be set apart because look at the reward those who do that they have the right to the tree of life they have the right to the kingdom they have the right to enter in but outside well you can read for yourself there what happens to those who don't bother and to finish it says you've been born again not of imperishable seed but imperishable what does a seed do what does a good seed do what do you do with it homie here's a good seed what do you do you plant it nothing happens unless you plant it what is the seed that god's talking about it's his word right so where does he plant his word Oof, in here right if it just sits there as a seed what happens nothing but he doesn't let it sit there he waters it doesn't it by the holy spirit the seed is supposed to grow and keep growing and result in good fruit the word should result in the in good fruit in your life the more you are just overtaken by the word the more you are part of the eternal word that's what you're joined to you are joining yourself to that which lasts remember how it ends the grass withers the flowers fade but the word of the lord is eternal that's what he means but we have to we have to do that active embracing of his word 
actively obey, actively seek to be holy, trusting that he'll do the rest. If we're doing our part, he'll do his part. And the combined effect is salvation. Eternal life, not in this manky wilderness, in the kingdom which is to come.